This is lesson number 106 in the New Testament is Fake series. And today's date is September 28, 2017. This lesson is titled, God Appeared to Abraham. This is another lesson regarding Genesis chapter 18, as I did another one earlier today. And I'd like to give a few more words on Genesis chapter 18. People do teach that God was a man and that man was Jesus and that he was there from the beginning. And even Hebrews now are boldly saying that Jesus was Yah himself whereas the way I understood it they weren't quite coming out and saying that at the start like Christians say that Jesus is God but slowly over time they are showing their true colors that they are still the same Christians of yesteryear but now they say Jesus actually is Yahweh now the person who is thinking learning to think properly who is following these Hebrew teachers that believe in the 2000 year old Messiah will understand that they don't have their doctrines correct because they taught you that the Most High created Jesus and now after a couple of years they're going to tell you Jesus is Yah so how can Yah the Creator create himself which verses, which prophets tell you that Yah created God? So you see, they're just studying everything that we teach and they revise their Messiah teachings as their doctrines are shown to be faulty and they have to fill in all the potholes. Genesis chapter 18, I'll read it first. Well, this audio Bible here, I'll just let it go from Genesis chapter 8, verse 1 to verse 8. Chapter 18. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of memory. And he sat in the tent door in the heat of the day. And he lifted up his eyes and looked, and lo, three men stood by him. And when he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door, and bowed himself toward the ground, and said, My Lord, if now I have found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree, and I will fetch a morsel of bread, and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore are ye come to your servant. And they said, So do as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened into the tent unto Sarah, and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the hearth. And Abraham ran unto the herd, and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk, and the calf which he had dressed, and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. All right, now... One of the things I want to point out quickly is that the people who are teaching you to worship a false god, Jesus, by telling you that he is God and that he appeared to Abraham, like he appeared to others in the Old Testament, they say, they're missing some important things, which I'm going to cover in this lesson. Because... The Lord that appeared to Abraham, the way I understand it now that I'm reading the Bible for myself, I'm rereading it. This Lord that appeared unto Abraham was not one of the three men that appeared that in the story that Abraham saw. How can we tell this according to my views? Rereading the Bible with plain common sense, which people are just given common sense to function in the world. You feel hungry, common sense tells you it's time to eat. The Mosai made it that way. 
when the earth changes, the world changes and things are restored and we can live in peace again, people will function by common sense because that's the way the world was at first and that's the way it's meant to be. So that by common sense, people cannot make an idiot out of you. That's why in Jeremiah 31, the Most High says, I'll put my law in your heart. Why? Because when you have it in your heart, common sense is going to tell you what the truth is and it's going to let you know someone is deceiving you if they come with another book and say but this is another translation that says this or that the most I is going to put in your heart so you're going to say i don't read from that translation whoever published that for you the most I himself put it in my heart common sense will let you know what the truth of the most high is once he corrects everything Look here now, if you say one of those three men is Elohim that created everything. Look at verse 7. It says, And Abraham ran unto the herd and fetched a calf, tender and good, and gave it unto a young man, and he hasted to dress it. And verse 8 ended up saying, And they did eat. I want to ask you a question. You, the thinking person, the person who is learning to think all over again, like I am learning to think all over again by rereading the Bible for myself. Because your teachers don't want you to think. Because false doctrine cannot have a mind that thinks for itself. So that's why I'm asking you. Because your teachers aren't going to want to answer this. Does God eat? Come on now. Does Elohim eat? Does he eat food? The first reference we find in Torah about eating food shows that it was given to man to do. And he told Adam, this is all the food you can eat and so on, but don't eat from that particular one. Food is for man to eat. And then there is food for the beasts as well. But it does not show that God sits down and eats food. It says that he placed a man in the garden which he made. And the garden was filled with food for the man. Elohim does not eat food. So one or two or three of these three men in Genesis 18 was not Elohim and was not Yahawashai or the Messiah because Elohim does not eat. Now you might think it's kind of funny but just for the effect I have to throw it in here but I'm not trying to be funny. Does he drink as well? And if he pees out, is that the rain that wets us? I mean, you might say I'm being rude, but I, I got to think in very simplistic ways because I want you to understand something is wrong. God does not eat food. He says it all throughout the Old Testament about blessing Israel and so on. And every time they went into transgression and they repented and turned back to the Most High's commandment alone and did not worship any Jesus or any other strange gods, whom their fathers did not know, but they returned to him and his commandments and his precepts and so on. He would bless them with lots of food, you know, like rain and the crops would grow and so on and corn and whatever and wine like the Bible says all the time. And when they got those things, they ate and he walked in the midst of them, but he never sat down to eat with them because Elohim does not eat food. When people eat food, don't they, pardon me, have bodily functions that help them deal with the food they process it and so on does he have a body the creator with acid inside his stomach to process his food and so on have you ever heard about the stomach of god processing and breaking down the foods does he pass gas from the food that he ate and so on and does he go to the bathroom to poo this is not a joke does god eat food and like i asked you if he needs to pee out some of what he drank is it the rain that fell well if he needs to poo when it's time to poo because people poo after they eat 
Where does he flush all that stuff? You see, I gotta be as simple as that to show you how simple minded the teachings of Jesus are, of Jesus' support are. It says they did eat, and the Most High, He does not sit down and eat food with anybody. He doesn't sit and eat as far as I understand. And if you say from your John 4.24 that God is a spirit according to the fake Messiah, does Elohim as a spirit eat food? And if he does, why would it be the food that Abraham seem to have made for him in this point, at that point. Because animals eat certain kinds of foods, you eat certain kind of foods, bees, flies, you know, whatever creatures there are, alligators, different creatures will consume certain kinds of foods that's good for them and can be processed in a certain way by their body based on how their body is made. Well, if God is a spirit according to to what the scriptures are showing us, then would he choose the kind of food that Abraham and Sarah put together on that day? Would he eat a calf? Or what? Would he eat an apple? What would he eat that can be processed by his body, his spirit? Your body is made a certain way to break down the food. How is his body made to break it down? So no, he wasn't eating no food here as one of the three men in Genesis chapter 18. Again, the Jesus teachers fail miserably because it says they did eat. So let me show you what's going on now in Genesis chapter 18. There's more than one story in chapter 18 of Genesis. One part of it is telling you that the Most High met with Abraham. He appeared to him. And then the story breaks from that rather quickly to telling you another story. Just like when you're watching a movie and uh, they're showing you, they're showing you, like, let's say it's like, the, the, let's say the police is chasing after some people and they just got word that the people are in a certain building. So they jump in the car and the sirens are on and they're rushing there and they're underway. And then it shows them speeding down the street with their sirens on, lights flashing. But then it breaks and it shows somebody else doing something else. All right? Uh, whatever. And then it comes back to showing the police car now reaching the building and they're getting out of the car, about to get into the building. So it's breaking up and showing you different stuff. Chapter 18 here is showing you in verse 1 that the Lord appeared unto Abraham. And then it breaks now and tells you quickly that he lifted up his eyes and saw three men. It doesn't even say three angels. He saw three men. So if you run over to chapter 19, verse 1, and talks about angels in, in, in Sodom, that's something else going on now. Because the story of Sodom is developing. So other things are being said about Sodom in chapter 19. So the story broke and said he saw, by the way, he saw three men as well. And he bowed himself and rushed over to them and said, hey, let me get you some food. Stay a while and so on. So that part of the story here now says that they heard they made him food. They made the people food, um, calf, tender and good and dress it. And they did eat. That's from verse two up to verse eight. So like I was saying, it's um, it says the three men. Most likely those are angels, it seems, but it seems to me to be saying that they were some men. It doesn't spell out the word angel at that point. Then the Most High now, they're making all this food. Then the story returns to focus on the Most High again now. And when it comes back to the Most High, 
then he starts talking to him again about Sarah having a child. Now verse 22, And the men turned their faces and went towards Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Now verse 22 tells you the men. So the is in reference to the three men. Because if you look in verse 1, it says the Lord appeared unto him, yet it spells out three men were also seen. One of these three men could not have been the Most High, because people just don't see the Most High just like that, as I was pointing out in the previous video. You just don't see him. So if it says that the men went, but the Lord Abraham stayed with the Lord, that means the story is telling you that the men went on about their business, but the Most High was still dealing with Abraham, who he appeared to in verse 1. So it's like there are at least two different storylines going on here. One part of the story is focusing on the men, and one part is focusing on the Most High dealing with Abraham alone. Now, if it overlaps a little bit and shows that somehow he's dealing, the Most High is dealing with Abraham through the men, then it may have shown something of that. That's why we would say those are no doubt angels. And it seems like that, possibly. Although it doesn't say angels when I read it. But at least it is not saying to anyone that the Most High was one of these three. That's people reading it into the text because long time ago people were taught that by people who wrote the New Testament in the Roman Empire. Because the text does not show that the Creator was one of these three men. It doesn't show that. So it's left to the mind to think that, if you choose to, but it doesn't say that. So the scriptures are not saying it. You can think all you want. If you are looking for concrete stuff, you must go by what is written. Now, since verse 1 here says, And the Lord appeared unto Abraham. I'm going to look at the word appeared. Now, if you look, and, and he appeared, and then in about verse 22, they left off, the men left off, but the but Abraham stayed with the Most High. That's because, like I said, at least two things were being done. The Most High appeared to him, and some men showed up as well. When the men moved on, the Most High was still dealing with Abraham, so he stayed because he was not one of the three. So when the three left, the Most High did not leave because the Most High was not one of them. So the Most High's presence was still there, so he continued to deal with Abraham. So Abraham remained with the Most High, who didn't walk off as one of the three. And then uh, if you go down to the end of that chapter in verse 33, it gives the closing out of how verse 1 opened up, saying that the Lord appeared. It says, And the Lord went his way. So the three men already went their way. So if he was one of the three, how come now the, the Mosai is going his way? Didn't he already go the way of the three that left? No. It shows you here, these people are saying, we know the Lord was one of them because in 19, chapter 19, verse 1, only two showed up in, in Sodom, so one of them must have been the Most High or been Jesus, who is the Most High, according to what they said. But no, verse 33 is knocking that down because it's telling you here in verse 33, and the Lord went his way, and it doesn't tell which way he went. So it doesn't say he went to Sodom. But at the same time, it's letting you know he was still dealing with Abraham, and when he went his way, he's, it's telling you that his way means that he stopped talking with Abraham. Because it says he left communing, means he left talking with him. Now if he says here, appeared, let's look at the word appeared. The word appeared, Ra'a, H7200, to see, to look at, inspect, perceive, consider to see, have vision, to look at. Keep that in mind, to look at, to observe. So it seems that when this word is coming into the text, it's giving you the understanding 
that something real and vivid vivid is happening and you can verify something so now when he looked sorry when he when the most High appeared then he also looked and saw three men that does not that does not mean that the most High appearing is equal to him being one of the three it's just telling you that it's showing a move of God that when the presence of the Most High came in, he gave the man something spectacular that his eye could see and something in the physical plane so that he can see some kind of activity to know that the presence of the Most High is there. It was common for people when they had an experience with the Most High to make an altar where they, or something like that where they had the experience to show some physicality in the moment that God's presence was felt right here. So he gives the man some physicality in showing him three visitors, not that he was one of the visitors. Because after the three left, it shows that the Most High continued to stay or remained to deal with Abraham. And when he was finished, in verse 33, it says, Then the Most High went his own way. Meaning he stopped communicating with him at that point. So the physicality that is associated with Ra'a is to alert attention to something that is going on right here in the text to let this be clear to Abraham that this is a quote-unquote move of God or God's presence is here. So if you look now at the Hebrew letters, if you look at the Resh, it's telling you that there is a leading person, a head person, and the he is saying, look at this, behold. So it's an ra'a right there is an announcing of the presence of the Most High because it said he appeared unto Abraham. So the Most High does something in that moment to let these three men who were probably angels appear at the time as well to announce the presence of of the Most High who appeared unto Abraham. If you look at the other times when Abraham actually was dealing with the Most High, you will notice something here. Look in Genesis, well not just with Abraham, but let's look at Ra'a and Abraham as well meeting with the Most High. If you look in Genesis chapter 1 verse 9, this Ra'a appears again, and it says, And God said, Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear. And it was so. Now I told you, the Ra'a dealing with Abraham's, um, the appearance of Abraham in Genesis 18 verse 1, is bringing in some physicality so that Abraham can tell that something big is going on. And this is an announcement of the presence of the Most High as well. So Abraham could see something, the physicality of the presence of these three men, who, like I said, are probably angels, as many believe. In Genesis 1 verse 9, this same Ra'a is showing that something could be seen as well when this word Ra'a is used, to show that there is a move of God as well, at this time in Genesis. This is the first time I can see this coming up. And it says here, let the waters under the heaven be gathered unto one place and let the dry land ra'a, and it was so. In other words, let the dry land appear, just like the most high appeared, let it appear. So it's something that can be verified because it can be seen. So he gives these three men so that something can be seen in the moment to let, Mo, to let Abraham know that you cannot see me. So because I have appeared, you got to see something in this moment, which is why prophets usually could see a vision because you cannot see the most high just like the way you would see a person. So he often does something to let people have that sensation of experiencing the Most High, either by seeing 
a vision, seeing something that would represent him in a vision or seeing someone that's actually doing something spectacular that would indicate the presence of the Most High or some thunder or something like that would happen or fire rumbling on a mountain and so on as in the case of Sinai. Something physical often um, or vision-like often accompanies the appearance or the presence or the communication of the Most High. But it does not mean that the rumbling and the thunder is God. It does not mean the smoke on the mountain is God. The same way it does not mean that one of the three men is God. It is just an accompanying of other, might I say for want of a better word, paraphernalia, in the text to show that the Most High has made an appearance right here. He has touched down and when he lifted up or went away, then 33 ended up saying, and the Most High went away. Because there was an appearance and now he went away. That means after the three men left, he was still there. Why? Because he wasn't one of the three. Because if he was one of the three, then when the three left, then the Most High's presence would have left as well. Genesis 12, 7, And the Lord appeared, same Ra'a again, age 7200, unto Abram, and said unto thee, and so on, the Lord, um, I will give this land, and there builded he an altar. See that altar again, something physical coming in, and the Lord appeared unto him. Now, it, again, it's shown here that in Abraham's life, the appearance of the Most High seems to often, if not always, accompany some kind of physicality. So Genesis 18 verse 1, all that's doing is just following the same trend so that Abraham continues to know this is the presence of the Most High because whenever he appears to me, it seems something physical happens as well. So the Most High appeared unto him and then he saw three men who just kind of seemed out of place at that time. Because he doesn't treat them the way you would normally treat some passerby. He rushes to serve them. In a way that makes it seem like, like you just wonder if he's connecting some divine presence or some divine action with the presence of these men right there. That does not necessarily mean that one of them is God. Because God is not a man. And Daniel 2.11 already tells you, which I told you before, the gods do not dwell in flesh. So one of these three was not no Yahweh Shai or Jesus and was not the Most High. The Most High was separate from these three men so that after they left long gone on their way to Sodom, it says that the Most High continued to deal with Abraham and then the chapter ends up telling you when the Most High was done, then he left and went his way because he was done communing with Abraham. Now let's look here this word appear when it says and the lord appeared i'm looking in a thesaurus new concise thesaurus thesaurus and it says appear it gives other words arise arrive emanate emerge issue look seem all right so if it says arise then when you deal with genesis 18 1 saying and the lord appeared then because verse 33 ends out the chapter saying the Lord was done communing, so he went his way. Basically means he went away from Abraham now. That's telling you that in verse 1 he appeared or he, he arose. He arose in Abraham, that sensation that lets him know he is dealing with the Most High. But because we are just mere mortals, might I say, he often, like I said before, gives us something in the tangible realm, in the real mundane world that we can connect to. Just like when Moses saw the bush burning, he could say that is an actual bush. If he goes and tells people, yeah, God said whatever, I never saw anything and so on, you know. So he said that and then an angel spoke out of the fire. <coughs> if one of us gets up right now and says, I heard from God and he says we should just all board planes and start leaving right now. Leave this Babylon. You'd be like, you're crazy. But if that person comes and they shows you some physical proof of them meeting with the Most High and there are witnesses that even saw this person have that kind of interaction and experience with the Most High and, it's, and they even catch it on film and so on and it's done in a way where the rest of us cannot deny that this person could not have done this particular thing themselves. Themself. 
we will be more inclined to believe that the person met with the most high why because some physicality was attached to it for instance if you saw the person just like lift up 25 cars and pile them on top of each other of course i'm just being kind of silly right but i'm just trying to show you that they did something physical that's not normal for people to be able to do you would say hmm you see that so the most high often gives us the people in the Bible, physical things attached to the expression of his presence, attached to his appearance, in order to communicate to the person who is the recipient of that experience that the Most High is appearing unto them. Even when Moses was scared to go back to the children of Israel in Egypt, and he had to go through all this stuff, put your hand in and take it out, throw down your rod, and it became like a serpent, and then reach your hand and pick it back up and so on. He's doing something in the physical that Moses can connect with to say, hmm, this is surely not me, Just it's not like I just fell and hit my head. I'm seeing and witnessing this right now. My rod just turned into a beast. My hand just changed color and it changed back. Something in the physical so that Moses can tell God is at work right here. He speaks to me. So there's no way I'm going to doubt this anymore. So now appear, so arise. So then when it says the Lord appeared unto him, he let Abraham arise. Because like in Amos 3, 7, he shows the secrets to his prophets and so on. So then uh, if Abraham is going to be seen now as a prophet, he, he, he had that experience of arising as far as it relates to the presence of the Most High appearing. Because one of the words of prophet deals with the, the Nabi, letting you know that the prophets would boil or rise up to a level where they can begin to um, experience some divine kind of communication. That's what happened here when it says the Lord appeared unto him. So that word appear could also mean arrive. So it's that the Most High arrived in Genesis 18 verse 1 and touched down and then he took off or left or went his way in Genesis 18 verse 33 to end the chapter, even though partway through the chapter the three men had already long gone. And the, verse, the, the chapter very clearly tells us that Abraham stayed with the Most High and that the Most High later left at the end of the chapter showing you that the presence of the Most High was something that was running as one story in that entire chapter and the dealings with the men is another part of the story that ran its course and then left partway through the chapter and they went to towards Sodom. Appear also deals with emanate, to emanate and emerge. Look at the word emanate from Cambridge Dictionary online. Emanate, the definition, to express a quality or feeling through the way that you look and behave. And that's what was happening here. When it says he arrived or appeared unto Abraham, he was expressing himself in everything in that chapter to show Abraham something that Abraham could connect with in the chapter that let him know something different was going on here. He saw those three men at the time when the Mosah appeared unto him probably to let him know that this is not the normal meeting of men, but these men signify the appearance or the presence of the Most High. Not in terms of the physicality of the men being God, but in terms of their, their strange presence that warranted his immediate um, his immediate um, hospitality as having to do with the appearance or presence of the Most High. Because if you see the Most High comes, you are not going to cook him food. The Most High comes to talk. He doesn't come to sit at meal with you. Emanate also means from Webster's Dictionary, to come out from a source, a sweet sense emanating from, like a sweet sense emanating from the blossoms. But anyway, 
let me read from this commentary here and show you that even experts now this is a i've read from this a number of times through before the interpreters one volume commentary of the bible this is just a lot of different people who have contributed to the writing of this this um this commentary i don't know how many it looks like probably a, I can't count it now. Maybe 30 or 40 different people. These are all scholars of all kinds. Scholars of the Hebrew, professor of Hebrew, G.W. Anderson, professor of Hebrew and Old Testament studies. Um, Peter Ackroyd, Old Testament, Pro professor of Old Testament studies, University of London, King, King's College, England. Uh, professor of religion from... Queensboro, Owensboro, Kentucky, all different kinds of professors and, um, you know, language experts and whatever in the Hebrew and all kinds of whatever. So now, hear what these people are saying now. Genesis 18, verse 1 to 33. God's visit to Abraham at Mamre. This resumption of the J story has properly been regarded as the immediate sequel to chapter 13. In the cluster of legends which places Abraham's dwelling in Hebron, the P narrative of chapter 17 is continued at chapter 21. Nevertheless, the unity imposed on the mass of material is partially indicated by the sevenfold reiteration of the promise to Abraham. And they give the references for Genesis 12 and 13, 15 and so on. The appearance of Yahweh at midday by the oaks of Mamre, the men are suddenly there. Which is why I told you that it seems to be that that's just letting Abraham know something is going on in the moment because they just seem to just show up. It's not like he just saw them coming from a long distance away. It just seems that they were suddenly there. So this is all recognized by Abraham that they're just there. Not until the promise of a son is made in verse 10 and affirmed in verse 14 can Abraham suspect who his visitors are. So then, if these people are one of them, is God, you're telling me the Most High appeared unto Abraham and he's met with the Most High before so much and he couldn't right away tell that this is God? Or one of these three is God? But Abraham knew that it was God eventually through the discussion through the words of Most High was saying to him, because I told you, the story is telling you that the Most High appeared unto him to tell him things, to talk with him. That's why 33 ends up saying, and he left off communing with Abraham. So it is through the communication that Abraham knew he was dealing with God who he did not see, but only could tell by the communication. But he could not tell and did not tell any godness of the three people through their physical presence. The way he told the presence of knew the presence of God eventually was through communication, not through physical presence of the man. That's why when he was done, he saw them on their way to help them find a way faster, I guess, or whatever like this is going to say. But he continued to talk with the Most High after because the Most High never left him yet. He dealt with the man, sent them off. They were just there to indicate some special presence of the Most High and the Most High was getting the job done now that he got Abraham's attention hey I'm here now you know he got his attention now the Most High goes on dealing with him and completes the communication and then left off can Abraham suspect who his visitors are right that's what they're basically trying to ask the relationship of the three visitors to Yahweh is difficult these experts are telling you these experts who know about the J and the P authors and so on of whatever of the Torah, which I can't even speak on properly. These experts who know more about these J and P authors and whoever else authors in there, more than you know, these experts are telling you, and the Hebrew professors as well, are telling you that the relationship of the three visitors to Yahweh is difficult. But you just started... Three or four years ago, five years ago, uh, a channel online teaching that this one of the three men is Jesus, it's Yahweh, and so on. 
because Jesus is Yahweh and he was one of the three. And you know all that. But the professors of the language of Hebrew and of the Old Testament studies who have traveled the world wide and done all kinds of crazy studies and so on and whatever, skilled in all kinds of linguistics and knowledge of the ancient East and lifestyles over there and so on, are telling you that it is difficult to understand and to, to really say the proper things about the relationship between the visitors of Yahweh. It's difficult to really tell that one of them is this Yahweh. It's like they can't find a clear connection to say one of them is Yahweh or one of them is Jesus. But you know, you are sure. And they've been doing this for decades and decades. So Yahweh appears in verse 1. But Abraham, who sees three men in verse 2, addresses only one in verse 3. And they said, would this one be the leader? You see, these experts aren't even sure that he was the leader. Because they can't tell you for sure by looking at the text. They can't tell you for sure. And if they're writing commentaries, you know they've been talking with many, 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 many very skilled people who have dealt with the Old Testament text and so on. And who themselves have looked at the Paleo Hebrew for decades. And they're telling you they cannot be sure that one of the three men in verse 3 was the leader, which would be Yahweh, who you would call Jesus or the Messiah. They're telling you we can't tell that, but you can tell it. And you can't even speak Hebrew. And um, so he addresses only one in verse 3. Is this a leader? They're just not sure. And several in verse 4. The men accept Abraham's hospitality in verses 5 and 8. And apparently ask together for Sarah in verse 9. But only Yahweh speaks in verse 10 and 13. The visitors go to Sodom. And they're saying all three in question mark because it's not quite clear right there in that verse verses and then they're saying see verse 20 to 22 so the visitors go to Sodom and you see how they just casually say the visitors go and then they have to put all three with a question mark because it doesn't say it just says the men so you just left to think that it's probably just all three because it was talking about all three all along so they go but Abraham talks with Yahweh who remains behind and they got that in question mind mark as well but at least they still put it there because the scripture does say that he stayed behind a later interpretation considers yahweh to be one of the three in genesis 19 verse 1 one chapter over why they're telling you a later interpretation because the text itself does not tell you that it doesn't tell you itself that yahweh is one of these three men but when you read the next chapter now, you look back and you say, oh, he must have been one of them. You think that's one. But it doesn't tell you, tell you that. It just simply says in 19 verse 1 that two angels showed up. That doesn't mean that Yahweh is one of them. And like I said in the last video on this topic with Abraham, how do you know the two angels are, the, are two of the angels or two of the men of the three that showed up in chapter 18. It doesn't tell you that. It doesn't tell you that. Because if they're wondering, they got to take stock to look at Sodom to see if it needs to be destroyed and so on. Then how do we know that they didn't go and bring back a report and now the two angels are just showing up now in chapter 19 to tell Lot and them, get your butt out of this place. And if Jesus is one of these two angels that showed up in Sodom, what? Then the men of the city are just, they just love him so much that they're just gonna gang rush him and bum rush him and gang, try to gang rape him. Can you imagine that? People trying to bum rush and gang rape God, who you say is Jesus. So a later interpretation considers Yahweh to be one of the three in chapter 19, verse 1, but clearly the tradition is confused on the point. So a later interpretation considers Yahweh to be one of the three. In chapter 19, verse 1, but clearly the tradition is confused on the point. They're saying it's just a tradition. That means the first person who started saying this eons ago wasn't sure himself, could not be clear, and could not prove it at the time to any person that lived at the time when this was written. They could not prove it. So it just became treated as a tradition. But even as a tradition, they're telling you, based on all their studies and research over the years on the text, <coughs> even such a tradition is confusing regarding this point.
The object of the visit is to predict the birth of a son of Sarah in nine months, as in verse 10, a promise that evokes in Sarah a laugh. Okay, I don't need any more of that. But okay, so you see what I'm saying here now, people, that based on the information from experts who, since I'm just learning Torah, it would be silly of me to ignore what experts have said about the text without considering what they have said. Even if you want to say they are not of our people, it is silly of me to ignore it because they've still studied the text. And they're putting it out there for the world to see. And they're telling you the interpretation of one of these three men as Yahweh is not clear. They're trying to tell you nothing is clear about that. It is just a tradition and the tradition is confusing concerning that point. So nothing is established about Jesus being Yah and about Jesus being one of these three or that Yahweh is one of these three men as well. Nothing is clear on that. That's just supposition on the part of those who want to try to pass off a Jesus from the New Testament as being the Most High that appeared in bodily form, eating food like a man who's going to need to pee and poo it out in some way.